we can return to Isaiah 55. Uh, remember what Larry prepares? I know he would much rather be here. Amen. Guess he got yesterday off. <laughs> I had uh, Pat, I was on my way home from working, and I saw him going into work. <laughs> and I was out in the yard just a little while later, and I saw his truck go back by. <laughs> Always being prayer for him and all the efforts of the church here. And certainly being prayer for the service of this Lord's Day. Do we have any prayer requests before we begin tonight? Can you pray for the dentist to see recover? Certainly, we talked to his Doing okay, though? Considering? He's, he's, he's improved a lot. Continue to improve. He's fixed to have his product worked on, too. Y'all feel like a new man, Charlie. Yeah. That's the hope. Even though I talked to someone else, I knew I had the same type of heart surgery in these. He said he felt weak for almost a year. Uh -huh. it, sure, it sure makes a difference once you get through. Right. Any other prayer requests? <laughs> I certainly remember those who we mention often in prayer. For those that meet among us that don't know Christ as Savior. May even tonight be the night that they might be born again. That the Lord might open their eyes. Amen. I'd like to talk about that a little bit tonight in Isaiah 55. This passage is a lot of times used by the Armenians. But I think it's a great message about really the freeness of Christ, if you will. We'll just read the first two verses for our text and we'll see where time allows us to get to. But Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which is satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank thee for this privilege and opportunity we have together with our people tonight, Lord, to worship thee. Uh, we pray to my good brother Larry as he's out at work, Lord, you might strengthen and encourage him there, Lord. I pray to bless him this new position that he's taken. Lord, I pray to you would be at the service of this Lord's day that you might let us all be able to be back again in thy house. And that even tonight, though, that you might stir us up as your people, that you might... Let us feel that presence here, Lord. You might even save souls among us. We thank thee for Christ and his sacrifice and thy goodness and faithfulness towards us. I pray that you speak to us through thy word. I pray that you get all the glory and honor out of the services and that the saints will be edified. So go with us now, I pray. Lead God and direct the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask all these things. Amen. And if I understood Brother Larry right, he said he'll start a new position Monday. You know, we'll have to work nights. But anyway, back in our text here, the, Isaiah starts with this interjection here, ho, to grab the, our attention. Mm -hmm. And he says, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Everyone is thirsting today, I can guarantee you that. But I guess the question is, what do you thirst after? Or what are you trying to fill that thirst with? Mm -hmm. well, unless you know Christ he'll try to fill it with everything of this world and it will only cause you to thirst again we can recall the woman at the well let's turn over there for just a moment John chapter 4 
John chapter 4 and verse number 13 and 14. Well, the story here goes that Christ came to Jacob's well in Samaria and the woman came and they had this discussion here about this living water. All right. It took her a while to get it, if you will. In her natural mind, she couldn't understand. But in verse 13, Christ says, says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, speaking of the water in the well there, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, he shall never thirst. But the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in everlasting life. The physical water can only quench your thirst for a little while. Just the same as things of this world can only quench that spiritual thirst for a time being. Only Christ gives the water that causes us to never thirst again. Mm -hmm. As he calls it there, the living water. Well, that water never dries up, does it? The well doesn't ever go dry. He says that there it shall be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. <laughs> that water that Christ gives will be everlasting. But many today, they're trying to quench that thirst, so to speak, with everything else but Christ. Well, they try to quench it with all that the world has to offer, and yet they thirst time and time again. And Christ says, or really, I guess God through Isaiah says, everyone that thirsts is coming to the waters. That's the waters that God has to offer. It's not Jacob's will. It's not the things of this world. You know, you don't have to turn it over, but John 7, verse 37, Christ says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood, stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. So the message hasn't changed, has it? Yeah. If anyone is thirsty today, they're to go unto Christ. Yeah. Come to the waters which God had to offer. That was Isaiah's message, and that was Christ's message. So come to Christ is the only way to, to quench that thirst. So even we as God people have a, a thirst, but it's a different type of thirst. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they who thirst after righteousness. Well, there are many professing Christians today who don't seem to have much thirst for righteousness, do they? They seem to desire everything else except righteousness. Well, we, as God's people, ought to be a righteous people, not a, not a self-righteous people. There's a difference. Not, you know, a, I'm better than you, I'm holier than thou type of righteousness. The righteousness which comes through Christ. And he says back in our text, O oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to waters, and he that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. Yeah. He says, Everyone that doesn't have money, he says, come and buy. Right. Well, spiritually, none of us had money, did we? <laughs> we were. Poorer than poor, if you will. Mm. And yet Christ says, just simply come and buy without money. That is the difference between the gospel and the world's religion. Exactly. That That's right. Sometimes you literally have to pay money. Sometimes you or you have to do something to earn it. But yet Christ, you can just come and take freely. He says, so it, it truly is the free gift of God. Romans 6.23 says, The gift of God, eternal life for Jesus Christ, our Lord. Mm. The last I checked, you don't go out and buy your own gift, do you? It's not really a gift. Well, I, jokingly, I went and bought myself my own Father's Day gift this year. I went and bought a 
a Glock. So that was enough to take up my holiday allowance, I guess. No, well, they've still got me more presents, but that was my present to myself. But that wasn't really a gift, was it? So I went and worked and had money and bought it myself. And that's the type of gift that most people want today, though, is that they want something they can earn, something they can obtain. No, the gift of God is without attachments, isn't it? It's free. As it says here, it's, if you have no money, you can come and buy and eat. Mm -hmm. oh, John 4, let's turn there for just a second again. John 14, back earlier in the discourse between the woman and Christ, the Samaritan well here, it says, Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith thee, Give me a drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So she didn't understand the gift of God, did she? Christ didn't say, If you'd asked, I'd have told you what you got to do to earn it, either, did he? He said, If you just asked him, he would have given thee living water. The salvation that Christ offers is a, we call it a no strings attached salvation. I mean, certainly there is service that we ought to do to follow, but there's no gimmicks, there's no fine print to read. Christ just says, Come and partake of me. Yeah. Well, there's no, well, now you're stuck in this contract for six months. There's no, uh, well, it really cost this much money, even though we said it cost this much. No, oh, the gift of God is truly the only free gift you'll ever have. You don't have to have money to buy it. You don't have to have a job to earn it. You don't have to do this or do that. Just come and buy without money, he says. He says, eat, come buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wine typically represents the blood of Christ. Milk, the nourishment which is in the word. He says, come ye buy wine and milk without money and without price. So we are to come and get this gift once again in this really it's the sacrifice of Christ his blood atoning for us and then his word nourishing us afterwards all that is once again not something we have to do to earn not something we have to purchase with money so Peter told Simon I forget what chapter is in Acts said thy money perish with you they thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. No, you don't have to pay the priest. You don't have to do a certain amount of prayers or good deeds. I'm just coming by, he says, without money. And without price. The gifts of God, they are invaluable, aren't they? Both the sacrifice of God or the sacrifice of Christ as well as the Word of God that we have. They are without price. They are prices, we could say. Well, certainly we go and buy the Bible from a bookstore somewhere or online. And that's not what he means. They're much more valuable than any amount of money we would pay for the printed Word of God. Consider Psalm or Proverbs, I mean, 23, verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Was it say also wisdom and understanding? And we have the truth right here in the Word of God. We're not to value it above all else, really. Certainly above all that the world has to offer. Going on, though, in our text, he says, verse 2, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? 
Yeah, he asked the question, where, where or what are you spending money on that's not bread? You know, we spend lots of our physical money on stuff that we don't need. But spiritually, do we spend ourselves on stuff we don't need as well? I'd say so, and especially the lost, they spend all sorts of this quote unquote money, if you will, on stuff that's of no use. Stuff that may satisfy the flesh for a while, stuff that may feel good. But if all you ever eat is sweets, and well, it's not going to be too good for your physical health. But all you ever eat spiritually is sweet sounding stuff, it's not going to be good for your spiritual health either. Wherefore, do you spend money for that which is not bread, he says. So Christ is the bread, isn't he? Anything else is not the bread of life. Let's turn to John chapter 6. So there are many who are literally spending all they have in hopes of something for eternity. And yet they'll be sadly disappointed, I believe, when they stand before God. There are many who work their entire lives trying to be a good enough person or do enough good works. Yet none of that will matter. He didn't say here, to work for the bread. We just say, why are you spending money on that which is not bread? Well, Christ offers his bread freely to all who will partake of it. I know we could discuss how the none will partake unless God enables them. But really it is available to all who will partake of it. John chapter 6, verses 33 35. Let's go ahead and read verse 32 as well. The Jews here were thinking about physical bread, such as the man that came down from heaven. And it says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. They were a lot like the Samaritan woman, weren't they? Mm -hmm. well, where's this living water you speak of? Where's this bread of life that you speak of? Verse 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh, unto, cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Christ is this bread of life, and all he says here is to come to him. And you will never thirst, you will never hunger again. Now that doesn't mean physically you might hunger again. Physically, I'm sure tomorrow you'll wake up wanting something to eat and something to drink. Mm -hmm. Well, with that spiritual thirst and hunger that's there in everyone, that it will be satisfied in the person of Christ. But many... Many today are spending their money on stuff that which isn't that isn't bread. There, are some of them are seeking after the things of this world, some false religion, some what they can do in and of themselves. But none of it is buying the bread of life. You know, the Jews were not mad at him for saying this, though, weren't they? You go on down to verse 41, it says, The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which come, came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Joseph the son of, or not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith that I came down from heaven? Well, the Jews, like always, were thinking carnally. Well, I. He did, in a sense, descend down from heaven into the womb of Mary, but he didn't. But he was born of Mary. But he was raised as a babe and grew into the fullness of a man. But he was God descended from heaven. 
Maybe that's more than the Jews could comprehend. They were, I'm sure, were expecting him to just ascend it down all his glory and just take over. He'll do that one day, but that time is not yet. The Jews, for some reason, they didn't like when Christ told them that Moses wasn't all that there was. That Abraham wasn't really all that special. Certainly he was in the sense that he was the chosen of God. He was the one that God used. But to be the son of Abraham wasn't anything extra special, if you will. It didn't guarantee you salvation. Moses was just the servant of God, just the same. And that manna, certainly it was a great blessing for the children of Israel. Certainly it was a miracle in and of itself, but none of that compares to Christ, does it? Before Abraham was, I am, Christ said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he said he was greater than their father, Abraham. Like I said, the manna was, I'm sure, something to behold. But the bread of life, something much greater to behold. Well, I mean, well, Larry was speculating what this manna might have been. They called it light bread in one place. Well, I don't know if it was similar to our white loaf of bread that we have today, or, but probably a little more pure than what we have. But no matter what it was, it cannot compare to the bread of life which came down from heaven. Christ just says, come and partake of this bread, and you shall never hunger nor thirst. Going back to our text back in Isaiah 55 he says wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and labor for that which satisfieth not well, there's one that definitely applies to today doesn't it so many working and working and working and never satisfied both physically and spiritually so well, you can do all these good works you want to but it will never truly satisfy the soul you can try to become the best person you want to be, but it will never satisfy that hunger and that thirst in the soul. Now, I don't try to get on Joel Osteen too much, but the more I know about him, the less I like him. You know, it's certainly not going to be your best life now. For the child of God, this will never be our best life. You know, for the unsaved, it will be their best life. So. Now, certainly, we, I'm not saying we shouldn't try to have the best life we can here, but it ought to be primarily our goal to serve God with this life. So many of they are laboring and they're not satisfied. But Christ said, Come unto me. Take my yoke upon my cord. Right. So my yoke is easy, my burden is light. A works way salvation, it's it's a hard yoke, isn't it? It's a, a heavy burden. One, you have to always worry if you're doing the right thing and if you're doing enough of the right thing and when you get to heaven or you get to have enough of the right thing and the good things. I would probably worry myself to death if I really thought I was had to work myself to salvation, knowing what I know about God's requirements. Yet Christ, His burden is so much easier than a works-based salvation. His yoke is so much easier and so much lighter than what this world offers and what this world tries to think. What are you laboring for then? Are you laboring for Christ or are you laboring for that which doesn't satisfy? Many even professing Christians are laboring for that which doesn't satisfy today. But he goes on to say, hearken diligently unto me, 
and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Well, hearken diligently, listen up if you will. Hear what's being said here. You know, over and over again, Christ said in the Gospels and also in Revelations, something along this lines, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Man. I know not everyone's going to hear. But we that hath an ear, if you can hear what God is saying, you better listen. Hearken diligently to me, and eat ye that which is good. I alluded to this earlier. If you eat a bunch of junk, it's not going to be good for you. you know, we as Americans probably aren't the best pictures of health, physically or spiritually. We eat a whole lot of junk, don't we? So we have sweets and fast food on every corner, and I'm probably just as bad as anyone else. So I try to cut out sweets, but I do have to follow temptation sometimes. <laughs> but that spiritual food, which isn't good, that's what we really ought to abstain from. So the, the world offers all sorts of it. You know, You'd be surprised how much false teachings I see go out in the mail. Everybody from the Catholics to the Jehovah's Witnesses are sending people stuff in the mail, and people sending them stuff back. I don't know if it's money or what, but it's all on. TV has plenty of quote unquote preachers to offer you some food that which is good. And the internet's even more full of that. Food which isn't good for you. But Christ says, eat ye that which is good. Christ is good. His word is good. We need to stop eating the junk and eat that which is good. Let's turn to, back to John chapter 6. Back where we were a minute ago. We about the bread of life. He goes on in his discourse down in chapter, excuse me, down to verse 51. He says, I am the bread of I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the first part of that people would fleshly, carnally thinking would think, well, I really want this bread that I can live forever. <laughs> it seems to be a big push today. We have to live longer and longer. Mm. You know, I, nothing wrong with, wrong with a long life if God's blessed you with it. But so many people spend countless time and effort and money to prolong their life, don't they? Yeah. So, uh, I heard someone I know was talking about the COVID vaccine and how it, you know, even though there's a, only a tiny percent chance you're going to die from the COVID itself, the vaccine gives you a a little bit more of a chance of not dying if you don't die from that itself. <laughs> How people were so worried about dying today, aren't they? You know, I'm not in a rush to get out of here necessarily, but I'm not afraid to go whenever the world have me to go. Yeah. Certainly, I would like to see my children growing and be saved and serving the Lord. So on, as long as the Lord will please, but mm. if I don't live to see tomorrow, I won't be unhappy. Mm. <laughs> I have to go deliver the mail tomorrow, if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he says, If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread which I, I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Christ is that which is good, isn't he? He is that bread of life, the living bread as he calls himself here. He says the bread is his flesh. Doesn't mean we're literally need to eat his flesh, does it? <laughs> this is not as the Catholics teach. That is the bread and the Lord's Supper literally becomes the body of Christ. No, it's a type of his bread. <laughs> to partake of this bread, I think it means to partake of his sacrifice, to be under the blood, if you will. To 
be covered by that suffering and that death which he died. He says, I will give. He says that I will give as my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Once again, they were thinking carnally. He's literally going to give us his flesh to eat. We're not carnal. We're not <laughs> cannibals. Well, that's not what Christ meant. He didn't mean you're literally going to feast on him. Verse 53 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Again, he's not talking about some cultish thing where we're going to sit around and drink cups of blood and eat human flesh. But we must partake of him, of his sacrifice, of his shed blood, of his body that was broken. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. You know, like I said, the Catholics, they try to teach transubstantiation, they call it, that the, that the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper is turned into the body and blood of Christ. But that's not what he's speaking of here. One reason I know that is because he says, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. There's no saving power in the Lord's Supper. It's a great memorial. It ought to cause us to reflect on what Christ has done for us. And it should be reserved for the saved, but there is no saving power in and of itself. No, he is speaking of being partakers in his sacrifice, being partakers in his shed blood for us. And except you are a partaker in that, you will not have eternal life. You know, this scripture alone I'll throw out works based salvation and salvation and any other besides Christ alone. Well, there is no other name given or heaven among men whereby we must be saved. It is in Christ and Christ alone. Except, as he says here, you eat of his body and drink of his blood. Except you partake, if you will, of his sacrifice. If you come and eat that which is good you will not have eternal life. Let's go back to our text to finish up in this portion here. Isaiah 55. After he says to eat that which is good, he says, let your soul delight itself in fatness. Know that fatness is abundance. Certainly we've got a lot of a fatness in this country physically, but that's not what he's speaking of. You've got a lot of physical fatness and a lot of material fatness, if you will, but we're pretty poor, if you will, spiritually. I know Christ, he says, let your soul delight itself in fatness. You know, there is more abundance than you can think of in the person of Christ. You know, it's not like there's just this little bit for you, and once you use that up, you're, you don't have any more. Christ in John 10, verse 10 said that he came to give life, and to give life more abundantly. There is great spiritual abundance in the person of Christ. We can be sure that there's great spiritual poverty in everything else. You when know, we sometimes... We turn to other things too, don't we? The Laodiceans were a great example of that. They had a great, the same Christ we have, the same God that we have, the same, quote, opportunity that we have, and yet Christ describes them as poor and miserable and naked, wretched and blind. And that was a true church just in the first century. So don't think that we can't get in the same spiritual condition today. You know, in Christ, there is a great abundance, a great abundance of grace and mercy and goodness, 
and all the other spiritual blessings that you can think of. You know, I said this on Facebook yesterday or this morning. I said that you would be able to sooner drink the ocean dry than to exhaust the grace of God. You cannot use up this spiritual abundance. Really, it's infinite. It's far greater than our minds can comprehend. It, it's, for lack of a better way of saying it, it's free and available to all who will come. I know that sounds Armenian to some of our brethren, but it is there for those who come to Christ. In the come unto me, I will know why it's cast out, he said. Just simply come to Christ if you don't know him. That's all I can really tell you to do. Yeah. Brother Larry often quotes verse number six of this chapter Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. You know, some people say that part of this passage is speaking to the saved because he says, Let him return unto the Lord in verse seven. But whether it's speaking to the saved or the lost or both. There is only a finite time when the Lord will be able to be found. <laughs> One day that's going to come to an end. One day you, they will cry out and he will not hear them. So they will cry up for the rocks to even fall upon them and they won't hear them. Let's go ahead and read verse 7 here. It says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The wicked, he says, let him forsake his way. This is not saying that you got to be a good enough person to be saved. There certainly is a change, isn't there, if you've been born again? To become a new creature doesn't mean you keep doing all the old things, does it? When you came and you ate and you bought this milk and this wine, then you're to turn from your wicked ways and serve God, aren't you? But the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. But in return of the Lord, he will have mercy upon him to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. You know, if you're saved and you're in sin, God will still give the same mercy, and he will still abundantly pardon today, won't he? Forgiveness didn't stop just when he saved us. And then we got to keep ourselves saved as some teach. I think we would all be in a mess if that was the case. But yet he says, Lord will have mercy and he will abundantly pardon. And certainly he will abundantly pardon if you are not saved and certainly he will abundantly pardon if you are saved. If you just said come to him. Verse 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, God's ways are not the ways of man, are they? Man's ways are, you've done me wrong, I'm going to do you wrong too, isn't it? Or you've done me wrong, the best thing I'm going to do is not do anything good for you. With God, we've transgressed His law, we've Really broken his commands. We are literally at enmity with him if we're unsaved, and yet he says, well, Come to me and I will give mercy. You have done me wrong, and yet come to me and I will freely give you this water and this bread of life. <coughs> if God thought was a man, we would all already be in hell today, I believe. Thanks be to God, his thoughts are much higher than ours. Verse 10 says, For as the rain cometh down, the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, maketh it to bring forth and blood, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So there's that water cycle they teach you about in school. The rain comes down, it, it waters the plants, it gives drink. To us and to animals, it fills the rivers and streams, 
And he goes back to God once again. And yet man foolishly thinks that that somehow happened just by chance. But he uses that to liken unto his word going forth or being preached and taught. He says in verse 11, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now certainly his, when he literally spoke, he accomplished that which he purposed. But his word is still accomplishing what he purposes today. You know, if all you do is get up and read some scriptures, and God can use that just the same, can't he? Yeah. In fact, I've heard of several people all they had heard was a scripture read to them and that the Lord had saved them. So it doesn't take a grand discourse or a fancy commentary. The Lord will use his word to accomplish that which he purposes. Sometimes it's for the saving of souls, sometimes it's to their own condemnation. Yet you can be sure when God's word goes forth it will accomplish his purpose. Sometimes it's to burden our hearts to cause us to turn back to him sometimes this causes people's hearts to be hardened according to God it's not up to us to worry about how his word will accomplish his purpose but you can be sure it will accomplish his purpose it will not return to him void you can never preach, teach or just simply read or quote the scriptures and it be in vain I'll go ahead and read verse 12, 13. We won't talk much on them, but it really talks about how we have great victory, if you will, with this promise of God. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Well, he said his word will accomplish that which he purposes. Yeah. Therefore we should go out with a victorious mindset, if you will. We should go out not, well, God's not saving anyone anymore. Oh, God is still very much able to save, isn't he? God is still able to turn people back to him that are, have turned away from him. He is still able to raise up a great nation to serve him. You know, I know the world is transgressing more and more towards wickedness. But that doesn't mean God's people can't serve him. That doesn't mean we can't live more and more for him. That doesn't mean we can't see great revival today. In fact, it seems that in the countries where they're not as free to worship God, that God moves more and more. China is very hard to be a Christian right now, and yet God seems to be working very mightily among the Chinese people. You can't even be a, a church over there without registering with the state. If you're not an approved church, they'll shut you down. Yet we complain about the way we have it over here in America. And God is able to really win mighty victories despite what the world may be doing. With that thought of that really promise, we ought to go out and be busy about the work he's called us to do. Proclaiming the gospel. This proclaiming this water and this that gives everlasting life. Proclaiming this bread which gives everlasting life. Proclaiming this wine and milk that you can buy without money. Yeah. That is what we ought to be busy about doing, not really anything else. Not sitting back, well, God's not doing anything, so I'm not going to worry about preaching or teaching. 
you know, the world's gone. As the saying goes to hell in a hand, but I just feel I'm not going to do anything. No, we ought to go out knowing that God will be victorious, that He will accomplish His purpose. Whatever that purpose may be is not our, really not our concern, is it? God sings great revival and turns this country back to serving Him, and everyone, I know not everyone, but the majority we are saved and we become a mighty nation again, then praise God for that. If He just sends revival among His people and saves some, and we are diligently serving Him, then praise God for that as well. But shame on us if we just sit back and do nothing. We just go about our routine and, well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to come back. <laughs> no, let us be busy about what He's called us to do. We'll close with that thought.